Hi guys, today's video is on all things to do with photosynthesis. So I'm going to be looking at the photosynthesis equation, the structure of the leaf, and also the factors which limit photosynthesis. So we're going to be doing the full picture. Remember that photosynthesis is carried out by green plants, green leaves, and it is an essential process and it's actually what supplies most of the oxygen that we breathe in. So we do not want to be cutting down trees and we do not want to be destroying plants if, as humans, we want to survive. So remember we have our green plant and it needs to absorb carbon dioxide and water and the water, remember, comes in at the roots. So those are the two reactants involved in photosynthesis. You need an input of light energy, which kind of powers the process, and then the two products produced are oxygen, which I've already said is essential for humans and everything else that lives to respire, and also glucose, which is what the plant's actually after. Because remember, photosynthesis is needed by plants because they can't eat, they can't take in food in the way that we do, so they have to make their own food, and that's what they use photosynthesis for. If they ask you for the balanced symbol equation, remember it's sixes, sixes, sixes. So, for example, we need six CO2s plus six H2Os, which remember that's six waters, and that goes to C6H12O6, which is the formula of glucose, plus six O2. So if in doubt, just write a six. So that's your balanced symbol equation. Remember that photosynthesis is an endothermic reaction, which means it takes in energy. Now, if they ask you about how the leaf is adapted for photosynthesis, you're going to mention the following things. First of all, it's broad and flat, which means it has a large surface area to trap that sunlight, to absorb that sunlight onto the leaf. It's thin, and that means that diffusion distances, so things which are diffusing are things like the gases, that is a nice short distance, so they'll diffuse nice and quickly. You've got air spaces within the leaf, which will enable those gases to diffuse again. Remember the palisade layer has lots of chloroplasts, and those chloroplasts contain chlorophyll, which trap that sunlight, and chloroplast is actually where photosynthesis takes place. Within the leaf, you've got a vein, and the vein brings up water from the roots and actually supplies the leaf with all its water needs. You've got stomata and guard cells, lastly. Remember that they're super important. The stomata is a pore inside the leaf, which actually allows carbon dioxide into the leaf and water to leave. And those guard cells surrounding the stomata actually control whether the stomata is open or not. So obviously, if it's open, CO2 can get in, and if it's closed, it cannot. Now we're moving on to the limiting factors which affect photosynthesis. So there's three ones you need to remember. That is carbon dioxide, temperature, and light intensity. All three of these things can limit the amount of photosynthesis can take place. Let's start with the most simple one of those, temperature. Obviously, if, you're low, if you have low temperature, then those reactants involved will be moving slowly. It's a bit like the effect of temperature on enzymes. So the particles don't come together fast enough and therefore the whole reaction slows down. So low temperatures will lead to low rates of photosynthesis. Obviously at very high temperatures you'll see that the enzymes involved in photosynthesis will be denatured. So you don't want to raise it too high. In terms of carbon dioxide, obviously low amounts of carbon dioxide will limit photosynthesis because actually it will slow down how much photosynthesis can actually take place. Because without CO2, no photosynthesis. Same with light. Light powers the whole process. If you've got low light levels, then you're going to see low rates of photosynthesis. And remember that all of these three things interact with each other. So you could have the most amount of CO2 ever, but if you have a low temperature or low light level, you're not going to see that much photosynthesis. You could have the most amount of light ever, but if you've got low CO2 levels, again, we're limiting the amount of photosynthesis. Just going to quickly touch on experiments involving photosynthesis, and they tend to use something called Elodea, which is pondweed, to measure the rates of photosynthesis. And the way they'll do this, remember, hopefully you've been shown this at school, is they'll get a piece of that pondweed, that Elodea, and because it's pondweed, it lives in water, so you pop it into a beaker full of water. Because it's photosynthesizing, we've already said that oxygen will be given off, and you can actually see those bubbles being released by the Elodea. So sensibly, you can actually count the number of bubbles that appear within a certain time frame, so something like 60 seconds is good. Here. So if you count the number of bubbles produced in 60 seconds, you can kind of get an estimation of how quickly photosynthesis is taking place. And if you alter the conditions that the Elodea is experiencing, then you can actually alter the rate of photosynthesis in that way. So one popular way is to alter the light intensity. So you may or may not have got a lamp popped at 10 centimetres away from that pondweed, count the number of bubbles, 20 centimetres away, count the bubbles, 30 centimetres away, count the bubbles. So in terms of your independent variable, remember that's the variable you're changing. 
So in this case, it would be the light intensity, i.e. the distance the lamp is away from that LOD. -er. The dependent variable is what you're measuring. So you're measuring the number of bubbles in 60 seconds. And the control variable is everything you need to control to keep it a fair test, to keep it the same. So obviously you need the same species of pond weed. So LOD -er in this case, you need to have the same length of pond weed because obviously a longer pond weed will photosynthesize more. You need to have the temperature the same, the pH of the water the same, and technically the concentration of carbon dioxide the same, although that will be quite hard to control. Right, I'm going to change now and show you some past paper questions. So I hope you found this video helpful and don't forget to subscribe guys. Bye. For the first question I'm tackling, question 11, plants obtain their nutrition by photosynthesis. Write the balance chemical symbol equation for four photosynthesis. I'm having major issue with matching my pen up to the iPad, so I'm just going to have to read it out loud. So it's 6CO2 plus 6H2O goes to C6H12O6 plus 6O2. So remember, like I just said in the video, all the sixes are needed. Explain how the rate of photosynthesis is affected by changes to the abiotic non-living factors throughout the day. That is worth four marks. Don't get all stressed out here. It's, it's told you what abiotic means, which means it's non-living, and it's asking you really about the factors which affect photosynthesis, which I just talked through. So pick two out of the three things I just mentioned, and then just give a reason how they affect photosynthesis, and that's how you'll get your third and fourth mark. So you can pick any two out of temperature, light, and carbon dioxide, and then just talk about the effect it has on the rate of photosynthesis. So, so you could say low temperatures lead to a lower rate of photosynthesis, Low light intensities lead to a lower rate of photosynthesis and the same with carbon dioxide. It's not as difficult as it sounds. Um, next up, explain how very high temperatures may reduce the growth of plants. So remember that high temperatures will affect those enzymes and what they'll do is they will denature the enzymes involved in photosynthesis, involved in the growth of the plants. So therefore you'll see less growth. You could see less carbon dioxide being taken up. You'll also see um, a loss of water because remember high temperatures means that transpiration will be taking place more quickly so more water will be lost from the leaf. Look at my transpiration video if you're not quite following what I'm talking about. Question 9. A student carries out an experiment to investigate the effect of changing the colour of light on the rate of photosynthesis in a water plant. She sets up the apparatus as shown. So this is very similar to the LOD experiment I just talked you through but rather than changing the light intensity they're looking at the colour of the light. So name the gas given off during photosynthesis. Remember that's oxygen because it, per, because it occurs on the product side of the equation. Explain how the student should control two variables in her investigation. So we could want to, we might want to control the light intensity. So you might want to use the same distance of the lamp from the pond weed or the same wattage of bulb. Anything that means that the light intensity is in the same. You might want to talk about controlling the temperature, and you could do that by using a water bath. You might want to control the length of the pond weed, so you could use a ruler to measure that. So anything sensible there. The table shows the results the student obtained from her investigation. So um, you've got red, blue and green lights and the number of gas bubbles released in one minute. And we can see that the gas bubbles increased with the red and they were the smallest number with the green. So complete the table by calculating the average rate of photosynthesis for the red light. You want to add up trial 1, trial 2, trial 3, divide them by 3, and you'll get a value which rounds to 25. Explain whether the results for each colour are reliable. You can say here that they are reliable because they have repeated the experiment three times. Red and blue are particularly reliable because for each of the trials the results are similar. Green you can see an anomaly on trial 3 where 6 is much lower than the 12 and the 16 which were achieved in trial 1 and 2.